The next panel on American competitiveness and Mars is going to be led by a former astronaut, and I think five times he rode the shuttle up, uh, ATK uh, Vice President of Advanced Programs, Ken de Rominger. Uh, he will introduce his speakers, James Brown and Julie van Kleek, to you. And um, I hope we uh, hear how we can use the competitiveness of industry and of this uh, great nation to get us sooner to Mars. Kent? Hey, well, thank you uh, for coming back from your break. And uh, the first couple, the keynote and the first panel this morning was really enlightening to me. I, I got a lot out of it. And I think what we're going to do now, uh, we're going to leverage and continue that discussion. And so uh, I'm Kent Rominger, as you heard. With me today, we have James Brown, we have Julie Van Cleek, and we have Randy Sweet. And the way I wanted to run this panel was I'm going to kind of give a bio on each one of the panelists and then let them go through either a discussion or charts that they have. And then afterward, through the panelists, then we really are uh, very willing to answer any questions you may have. I've got a couple for the panelists. But uh, please be thinking of questions you have as we're starting through this. So James Brown, we have an interesting mix today on the panel. And I guess the first thing I should say is uh, one of the panelists, well, and actually the moderator, uh, didn't make it for a, a couple reasons. One was sick and the other wasn't. So Randy Sweet was kind enough to jump in for us today. Uh, but James Brown, sitting here to my left, is Executive Director of the STEM Education Coalition. Uh, this is an alliance of more than 500 business, professional, and educational organizations. And it works to raise awareness in Congress, the administration, and other organizations about the critical role that STEM education plays in enabling the US to remain the economic and technolo technological leader in the global marketplace for the 21st century. And STEM, uh, you know, I'm happy to see that STEM is getting more and more attention as we go on because it, it is truly a need. Uh, prior to joining the, the coalition, James was the uh, assistant director for Ag advocacy of the American Chemical Society. He's a nuclear engineer, uh, and he previously worked as a legislative aide for Representative Doc Hastings of Washington, was a director of policy and development at the Consumer Energy Con Council of America, and began his career as an engineer with Newport News Shipbuilding, working on aircraft carrier construction. So thanks. I might have flown off yeah. a couple of those aircraft carriers you worked on. Probably not. <laughs> I probably flew off ones that Good were chance. well there before you were. He received a Bachelor of Science from the University of New Mexico, a Master's from Penn State, both in nuclear engineering, and he holds an MBA from George Washington University. So with that, James. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kent. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here and to speak to an audience like this. It's, uh, it's also relatively tough to speak to an audience about space issues when you have so many distinguished people like Buzz Aldrin and others in the audience. So it's definitely an honor. Um, when I talk about this issue, I'm always surprised by the breadth of STEM education and its applicability to different industries and different national missions and different things that pervade our society. And when I start talks like this, I, I'd like to talk about one stat that I think summarizes our particular challenges within the STEM education community quite well, and that is a, uh, a poll was done in 2011 by the Harris Group that polled parents about issues related to STEM education. And they, they found that roughly 93% of parents consider that STEM should be a priority within the school system, but that only about 49% thought it was a challenge, I mean, was a priority within the school system. So that is our challenge, if you really think about it. Everybody recognizes the importance of the STEM subjects, whether it's to space or it's to national security, or it's to the future of computing, or any other uh, technological or scientific endeavor that we, we, we know from our history will lead to the future of the country. But we have yet to make the kinds of changes in our education system to really prioritize those subjects. And certainly, if we're going to get to Mars, 
we need to draw from every part of our talent spectrum to get there. It's going to take smart engineers. It's going to take smart astronauts. It's going to take people who can build the equipment that will get us there. It's going to take welders. It's going to take people of every um, background to be able to do that. But the other poll I'm quite fond of is that, uh, and this is a Raytheon poll from several years ago, is that 68% of parents think their kids are in the top third of their class. And if you think about that, that sort of illustrates the first statistic uh, quite well. Um, but at the end of the day, um, there, I think there are three things when we think about how to build a competitive workforce that can support the kinds of grand national missions like going to another planet. Um, I, I think about three things. One is we need to get our federal house in order. Um, as we all know, we're dealing with the political gridlock of perhaps a century or more, and that is going to have a high watermark, and I hope it's going to recede, and we will get to working on challenges like improving our education system at a national level. And so the United States invests about $3 billion in STEM education programs, but they're scattered across some 250 programs. And that in itself is a challenge. I know people in the NASA family are always dealing with issues of efficiency and trying to get the most out of federal investments. But we've got to make sure those investments are well spent and that we're making the kinds of big bets that will get us down the road to impro towards improving education. The other is the states are dealing with what are called the common core standards in math and science. And I think that is an interesting opportunity for us to improve math and science e education across the board. Um, those standards have been developed by the states. There are lots of collaborations between states and one another. And it would be nice if when my daughter, who is four and a half, is uh, in the seventh grade and we decided to move from the District of Columbia to the state of Washington or somewhere else, that we didn't have to repeat, repeat algebra. So that's another um, thing I think is going on that's very positive and that's moving in the right direction. And the third is, if you think about the workforce that underlies the STEM fields, it's a little known fact that roughly 50% of that workforce is not going to require a four-year degree to enter that workforce. And when you think about STEM education, at least in the minds of policymakers in this town, most of the time they're thinking about the rocket scientists. They're thinking about people who are going to study in graduate school and who are going to measure their productivity by things like patents and intellectual property and other things. But roughly half the jobs right now that are available in the STEM fields don't require a four-year degree. So there are your technicians, your auto mechanics, and everybody uses software these days. So even if you're going to work at the most basic level in a STEM field, building something in an advanced manufacturing facility, you're going to need a background in the STEM subject. So I think those are three important trends that underlie the challenges of getting to Mars, of improving our health care, of dealing with every other major challenge our country faces. Great. Thank you. And you know, I already have a question for you, James. The, uh, it makes a lot of sense that it's important to improve our education facilities, the quality of education. What about the other side of how do you incentivize these children to want to go into the STEM fields? Is that a big piece of it as well? Well, I think if you ask the 93% of parents that think it's a priority, I think most of them, do we have that? So could we go to the next slide? Well, so one of the stats that you'll see is that most of the parents get that STEM is where the jobs are. And I think if you look at the pipeline of students going into those fields, what you'll find is the parents see the connection between getting a good STEM education and jobs, but there are lots of parts of our society that are being left out of this. So if you look at, for example, the STEM workforce, African Americans are 11% of the population, but only 3% of the STEM workforce. And the same is true for Hispanics. It's also true for certain fields for women. And I think that's one of the challenges in terms of how do we expand that pipeline and how do we really, um, how do we really get at that challenge? Because it's not, it's not just good policies in education so they have good tests and you have good curriculum and you have well-trained teachers. The, the kids can see the examples of science and technology in, in society if they have mentors in their families, if they have um, good role models, and I think you're starting to see that emerge in, in the computing fields. Look at the popularity of Neil deGrasse Tyson in the Cosmos series. That is really getting attention. And it's not often that you've had a face like his as the face of a big science and technology enterprise. Great, thank you. 
So our next panelist is Julie Van Cleek, Vice President, Advanced Space, Sister, Advanced Space and Launch Business Unit at Aerojet Rocketdyne. In this position, she's responsible for space and launch propulsion research, technology development, and product development programs. Ms. Van Cleek joined Aerojet in 1981 and was appointed to her present position in June of 2013. Prior to this assignment, she was Vice President for Space and Launch Business Unit and the Space Programs Organization for Aerojet. From 2004 to 2005, she was Executive Director for Atlas Programs. From 2001 to 2004, she served as Executive Director, Space Systems Business Development, responsible for strategic direction, investments, and growth of Aerojet space propulsion business. From mid-1999 to October 2001, she managed a multinational commercial launch vehicle project, during which she interfaced extensively with foreign launch vehicle companies and affiliated government agencies. Uh, Ms. Van Cleek earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical and Aeronautical Engineering from the University of California and has extensive hands-on experience in fundamental rocket combustion research and development, systems engineering and liquid rocket and system design, development and testing. Um, gosh, there's a, a lot of great stuff here. She also is the chairperson of the European Space Propulsion Board of Directors. Uh, so anyway, I guess to summarize this, and in Julie's own words, she truly is a rocket scientist. So Julie. I used to be. <laughs> Over Have the first slide, please. Oh, I think that's the last slide, isn't it? Um, oh well. Um, what I'm going to talk about is actually um, this, you know, going to Mars and how that affects U.S. competitiveness. And I'm going to do that from the standpoint of being a rocket company. Um, you know, as I start this out, let me talk about what competitiveness is, and I'm sure everybody's got a different idea of what that, what that means. If you look at definitions, it's the ability um, to sell things into a market relative to others. And if you think about the U.S., I would say that, um, you know, we're very competitive. Many people would say we're very competitive worldwide. I think a lot of that has been because we've been technical leaders, you know, and pushed the envelope in a number of things, which is a part of you know, the American spirit. You know, as you get more of an um, international marketplace, you know, that's still very important, but then the other way for competitiveness is how do you maintain, you know, being the best value or cost effective? And that, you know, speaking from being a rocket scientist, we've always pushed the envelope, but only in the last, you know, 10, 10 years has being more cost competitive really come into you know, our vernacular. Because we were always like, can you really make it happen? Can you really do it? Now, space is becoming part of everybody's life. It's becoming more of an international commercial marketplace. So now it's how do we come, become competitive? And so you look at this and say, OK, humans to Mars, does that have an effect on American competitiveness? And I would say it absolutely does. You know, if I look at what makes you competitive, what makes you know, many of our aerospace and defense companies competitive. It's, you know, do we have the technology? Are we gonna, you know, push the envelope and sell those things and provide those things no one else has? Then do we have products that meet certain needs? And then do we have the workforce that can keep all that going and keep, you know, making ourselves more competitive and keeping this a sustainable business? And so I'd say with you know, trying to get to Mars, we're going to attack every single one of those things. And I think it you know, could b bring great value to this country. Next, next slide, please. You've seen this slide before. Um, you saw it earlier. I think uh, uh, both Mr. Bolden as well as the past panel used it. And if you look at it, it it's showing, charting a course to Mars. And some people say, oh, we're not going to Mars till 2030. But I would say, we're going to be going to Mars. We're, we're building the infrastructure, the workforce, the products to take us to Mars. And that'll be ongoing for the next 15 to 20 years. And it's necessary because this is a very difficult thing to do. But along the way, we're going to be driving competitiveness into the, the people and the, the um, companies within this country and likely worldwide. You know, if you, you look at, um, the, reflect on this slide, you see some of the basic building blocks 
you know, for this, the SLS and the Orion system. Those are gonna be very powerful rockets, the most powerful rocket ever built. You know, Orion will be, you know, a very special crew capsule that will be able to do many, many different kinds of missions. In developing this infrastructure, we've had to face technical challenges we hadn't had, had to do before, and in that we'll expand the capabilities of our workforce. Once we have these products, you know, we've moved from just pushing the state of the art, but we now have products to sell to other applications. And if you heard Mr. Gerstemeyer earlier, he's talking about modularity and using things. You know, you, you look at where we're at in this country and we're not where we were during Apollo, when we were just trying to achieve a very specific goal. Here, we're looking at sustainability. Here, we're dealing with constrained budgets. And with those things, we drive the need to look at the problem differently. We can't just spend money to go achieve a singular goal. We live in a budget-constrained environment. Every investment we make needs to have payback elsewhere. Yes, furthering science, furthering technology is very important, but we want to be doing that in a way that leaves us with products that can be used elsewhere, making good on that investment. And that's the thing that this budget-constrained environment, I think, is doing, you know, is, is putting us all in that, um, in that environment of having to think about how do I, how do we create architectures, create products that not just, you know, achieve a very difficult thing, but can also be useful in other ways. And to me, that underscores the definition of being competitive. Next slide, please. Okay, Mars is hard. Okay, Mars is, um, you've heard and, you know, from Dr. Gazarek, many of the different challenges. And it's pretty exciting when you think about him trying to attack all those different things, you know, with the amount of resources he's been allocated. It also gives you a perspective of what we're really facing to do this. But as we, you know, attack each of those different technologies in the areas of, you know, transportation, and for us that means propulsion, you know, as a rocket company, but life support and also the landing and living, we are gonna overcome a number of difficult things create new technologies, and we're gonna see those things result in other products we can't even imagine today. If we think of the many things that came out of the Apollo program and the space program to date, we see the, the cameras in our cell phones, we see clean water systems that are being used in Mexico. You know, attacking those many different technological hurdles will result in things that will benefit, um, you know, not just the Mars program, but, but mankind and, and companies, you know, across the world. Next slide, please. And um, with that, you know, it, this will enhance the competitiveness of companies within the U.S. As I, I think uh, we were going through putting together for this panel, every dollar invested in human spaceflight has returned eight dollars, um, you know, to the U.S. economy. I would imagine we'd see a similar type of return, you know, not just going to Mars, but on our journey to Mars as we move through the, you know, getting beyond Earth Alliance and then actually on to Mars, you know, in the 2030s. Next slide, please. And then I bring it to home. You know, I work for a rocket company. Um, we heard a little bit about solar electric propulsion. We had some questions about that, you know, with the last panel. And, you know, to me, this is a product that, you know, solar electric propulsion, the reason it's important is it's much, much more efficient. If you can use it for a certain application, much more efficient than commercial. That means you carry less propellant to orbit, which means your rockets are smaller, which means everything's much more affordable. And if we look at where we're at today, we're using solar electric prop propulsion in both some of our, uh, you know, in our satellites, both government satellites as well as commercial. The commercial world has really jumped on board that you see a number of different satellite architectures um, being upgraded to go either partial or all electric. And that's because the economics are good. What this, what, you know, the place of solar electric propulsion in, in, in the pursuit of Mars is to develop the higher power systems and to develop those infrastructures such as solar electric tugs that were, I think in the last panel we talked about barges. They think about like barges in space to actually move things around. And these will be far more cost effective than doing this with chemical propulsion because now you don't have to lift all that propellant off the earth. You lift a, lift a much smaller, smaller portion of that. And so as we look in the, the type of systems that are relevant to you know, our, um, our pursuit of Mars, we'll be driving the power up, driving this, the capability of the solar arrays, the propulsion systems, and the power systems. 
And what we will see is those migrate into the commercial satellite world, um, probably in the next generation or the generation after that, after that in their buses. And so truly enhancing, by, by developing this, we will enhance the competitiveness you know, of the propulsion industry and the commercial satellite industry in general. So you know, just tried to give you a snapshot of some of the key things that I think can come from this. I've tried to bring it home to what it means to a particular company, a company like ours in propulsion. And you know, I look at all the things that, that were talked about in the last panel and look forward to seeing what else we're going to see today. And being a big science fiction person, you know, I look and say, we're finally making science fiction real. And I really um, am thankful to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. So the panelist on the end here is Randy Sweet. And uh, in his defense, until about seven minutes ago, he didn't even know he was on this panel. Uh, so he's, he was kind enough to jump it in. Uh, when I heard Randy was in the area, I thought, hey, Randy will be great. I've had the, uh, the benefit of getting to work with him. Randy's been with Lockheed Martin for over 30 years. He's a director of their civil space in business development. But he has a heritage back into the shuttle program. As a matter of fact, he was an orbital test conductor. So when the, uh, when the, the shuttle's being processed and getting ready to fly, when the astronauts climb in the vehicle, they are working with OTC, orbital test conductor, if you will. So Randy, with that, the floor Thanks. is yours. Thanks, Kent. Obviously, I don't have any prepared remarks, but um, I would like to talk a little bit about my perspective of, uh, first I'll talk about STEM here a little bit. We, we obviously, on the Orion program, we do a lot of work in the area of STEM. Um, both domestically and internationally. And I have to say that, uh, you know, we had an exploration conference, so probably 10, 10 years ago, with uh, James Cameron was one of the uh, keynote speakers. And um, one of the things he, he told us, and we've kind of uh, built upon this, is you guys should take a look at the entertainment industry and look at what they do. And he even used the word avatar, and this was way back before the movie Avatar. But basically what we find in STEM is, and we're missing this from the shuttle days, and Kent, you know this well, is we would send crews out to events, flight crews out, and, and the, the students would ask lots of questions about what it's like to fly and what it feels like and some of those things. That's certainly a motivator for STEM, for, for students. The other one is um, um, you know, near-term successes and events. We're starting to um, make a lot of progress on Orion. We got the flight test coming up. We, uh, we have lots of events where we'll test a heat shield or we'll transport something. And it's amazing, social media just blows up. So there's a lot of interest out there. When we talk about Mars, it's just incredible. But in a lot of cases, conferences like this, we're, we're essentially talking to a fairly small community within ourselves. So, you know, it's, um, it's really good that we have organizations like Explore Mars that are broadcasting this stuff. But I think as we get closer to flying, um, we have more, uh, more uh, engagement from uh, pop culture and the entertainment industry. We do a lot of work with them. You'll be seeing more of that once we get crews assigned and we start getting crews uh, more involved in events. I think those are things that we can do to really kind of engage the, the STEM community. We have a we have a, uh, a, a program we call the Exploration Design Challenge coming up on Orion, where we're flying a radiation test sample. And we've had a contest, and I can't remember the numbers, but over 100,000 students have applied. Um, this is open internationally, so we've gotten, I think, 80 countries involved. Um, we're going to be announcing the, uh, the, the finalists and the down select at the uh, USA Engineering and Science Festival coming up here. Um, so it's gotten a lot, of, uh, a lot of attention, and there's a lot of interest out there. So, um, so I think we just need to keep, keep doing that Great. with that. Yeah, Th thank you so much. And so folks that have questions, uh, please start making your way to the mics. Um, to maybe put this in perspective, uh, when guys like Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped on the moon, that had a phenomenal impact globally. And I think a result of that is the huge numbers in aerospace, engineering, technical fields today. 
I, I know as a kid, I was very, very incentivized by that. And as a result, I think where we are today is, I think all of our companies, uh, the average age of a worker is in the 50s. And so what we've seen is that huge generation that was inspired is moving through. And so in the next 10 years, there's going to be a large exodus and, and vast opportunities for the younger, for the brand new workforce. So to me, it's an exciting time that they can come in and not only be a part of something, but be given a lot of responsibility because none of the old timers will be left, right? There's a big gap in experience. And so do we think something like going to Mars and putting humans on Mars can kind of reset that kind of excitement? I don't know, what do you think? Well, I, I, for one, am a huge proponent of doing these kind of big things. I think, uh, I mean, there, is there anything you can propose that would be bigger in science and technology than to put a person <laughs> on Mars and bring them back? I mean, I, if you want to ask the, I, I would ask this question slightly differently, and I would say, you know, I'm sure in 1956, there were people sitting around saying, why on earth are we wasting our time about going to the moon? What's in it for us? What's the commercial value of that? What are the, you know, why will anybody care? But I don't think anybody looks back on that and doesn't think it was, number one, a good investment of federal dollars and of, of <coughs> time and, and, and people and energy. Um, and I, I think we would look back on going to Mars the same way because I think it's such a uniting force to try and do something enormous like that. And I also think the interesting dimension to this debate about space exploration now is that you have a viable commercial sector as well. So, you know, you can look at it as an inspiration for kids, but you can also look at it as a very American thing where you're going to attract entrepreneurs who think of making, making, you know, fame and fortune off of doing it as well, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Great. Thank you. And do we have a question down here? Sure. <clears throat> Uh, Mike Wright Goddard, uh, Space Flight Center. Uh, in my um, outreach to high schools, especially those that aren't located near NASA centers or in metropolitan areas, I'm finding that they really don't have any awareness of what you know the country is doing in space exploration. And um, more significantly, their funding for STEM is such a small percentage of that for other activities like athletics, for example. In fact, at this one high school, they had to actually have a bake sale or something to have a robotics competition, and they didn't get enough money, so they didn't have it. Uh, and yet, they've got this huge football field, you know? And uh, so I, I, I guess my question is, how do we uh, encourage, not only encourage the students to get interested, in lieu of a, an active human exploration program beyond low Earth orbit, how do we bring that Apollo-like interest in STEM that, that Apollo generated kind of on autopilot, basically? You know, we didn't, it just happened because everybody was interested in the program. P young students wanted to get involved in engineering and science and math. We don't have that this year, you know, at this time, at least not that I'm aware of. So um, how, do we, how do we get them involved in, in or interested in in pursuing those things with a visibility that they see with the sports on TV and some of the other aspects of our society that um, aren't, you know, that are more visible than the space program. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll start to answer that. I think there's two halves to the equation. I think one of the keys in getting more kids interested in the STEM fields and getting them into those type of careers is, is very, um, very uh, sobering, and that is we have to have policy changes that will make the kinds of things happen in the classroom and outside the classroom that will really make a difference. And so when I hear stories about schools that have tried to do these things on their own and have struggled, it's, it's not the first time I've heard that story, and I would say, we do a very good job in our best high schools in the most affluent neighborhoods of dealing with the STEM subjects. So when you watch a media report, 
It's a lot of times kids in white lab coats who are going to college before they were involved in the after school program or the engineering competition or other things. They were already on that direction and we're accelerating them in that direction. I think there's another category of stories that aren't being told as much about the struggling schools that also see that these subjects are important, see the jobs, see the connections to the future, but either don't have the resources, don't have the expertise, or don't have the critical mass to make all of that happen. And that's where the policy change that I started talking about at the beginning is going to have the biggest bang for its buck. It's in those schools that will achieve that. But the other half of the equation is the inspirational piece. Um, if a child is, is tr properly educated and has all of the right supports in school, but they never see the other end of the equation, they never see the grand design that they can fit into, or they never have the mentorship experience that they can fit into, then that's, that's also a weak link. And I, I think an interesting part of this is um, we're only starting to understand how to hook people from outside the sort of traditional STEM college-bound population into the STEM fields. I think you can see this in the resonance of the astronauts of color and women, too, and how young women relate to female astronauts. And I think that is something that we have to take into account when we're thinking about these things as well. And I would also offer a challenge to the space industry. Um, so if I had a meeting with James, Cam James Cameron, I would be thinking to myself, um, I wonder if we could get a number of space companies together and get a movie done about going to Mars. And not, not, you know, I know we've had movies like this before, but wouldn't it be nice to have one every so often so that people didn't look at, you know, Val Kilmer going to Mars and say, I don't even know who that is, right? Yeah. So just to follow up on that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I we do the best we can with STEM given the budgets that we have, and I think NASA does a great job of it. I know my fellow companies do a great job. We're certainly out there doing everything that we can. But as I said, I think we need to leverage a, a few things. One is upcoming events that we have that we all need to take advantage of and try to get that out there and get the, get the, uh, the top tier media involved so that it really is you know, a, a topic of, uh, of uh, discussion on, the, on the, all the talk shows and, and such. The other is leveraging um, pop culture. And it's amazing when you look at role models of these students, especially the, the K through 12, they really look at the entertainment industry, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's really amazing the leverage you can get out of that. And then I, I still say that astronauts are, are a big motivator for young kids, and we need to do more of that, and we're certainly talking to the folks at JSC about you know, trying to get crews assigned early and, uh, and trying to get more crew involvement in some of these events that I talk about coming up, and it's, it's really tremendous. Uh, you know, the, uh, the impact that you can have when you bring their role models into play. Thanks, do we answer your question? Uh, yes, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, this is a discussion of American competitiveness. How important do you all feel uh, that cross-energy and cross-disciplinary synergy between exploration technology and green technology and medical technology is in helping American competitiveness, because it seems to me that the way to get more involvement and more money is to understand that there's a very deep synergy between all these fields. And how do we organize STEM education to help maximize the perception of that synergy and stuff like that. Uh, so any thoughts on that? Yeah, great question. So um, the first thing I'd say when you're thinking about competitiveness is it's a relatively new concept in, in certainly in Washington and within policy circles. And I think it's a term that we need to spend more time trying to understand what its actual components are because I think yeah, when policymakers think about this, if you roll back the clock a little bit, um, six or seven years ago, it was competitiveness with India and China. That's where the Tom Friedmans of the world sort of define the future of competitiveness. But in some sense, I think we're also competing amongst ourselves because when you talk about federal investments and things, and you talk about changing the education system, really competitiveness, I, when I hear that term, I think about the ability of 
families to improve themselves one generation over the other. And doing that very well is what makes us competitive within the rest of the world. And I think, again, when I talk about this issue of competitiveness, the biggest gains for this country in that field are around the issue of equity. When, when the biggest potential gains are getting people who are not within the STEM pipeline into the STEM pipeline, I think about that being a huge advantage that we have as a country because we have a tradition of trying to broaden, broaden opportunity for all Americans. And the STEM fields are a tremendous, if you believe that, that brain power and capability are equally distributed across all different parts of our society, then that's the, by far the biggest place to gain because if you have role models that can, that can inspire people from all different backgrounds. That's part of the way why you'll, why, how you'll open up that pipeline. But I think to get back to your, your first question about competitiveness, I don't think we fully understand what being more competitive in the global economy actually means in terms of how do we measure it. And I think that's a good place to start. Yeah, I think um, the competitiveness, um, you know, it stems to, like you said, I, I'm not sure we all have the same definition of what it is, but certainly as we, uh, approach difficult technical problems and create new things, create new materials, create new processes for dealing with harsh environments, you know, that, that brings us to have a skill that we didn't have before, and that allows you to push the state of the art. That, that's one way to enhance competitiveness, assuming someone will want what you did. I think the other thing about um, a program like this is it forces us to think of ways to um, make things more uh, cost effective in a constrained environment. And that by its nature is forcing a number of companies now to look at their manufacturing processes, their development processes differently. And so it's forcing them to be more competitive. And as we've talked about with STEM, having you know, a, a, a mission like this and the many steps it takes to make this mission real, if we do our jobs right and we, we provide that inspiration of what this is, that will draw people, new people, into our companies, you know, this next generation. And with that, that enhances the competitiveness of our companies by rejuvenating them, bringing a different mindset. As, as Ken said, we're, we tend to have a, a, an older workforce right now, you know, infusing that workforce with a number of you know, a large percentage of just out of college. I mean, that will change the face of many of these companies that do very special things right now and make them stronger for the future, so. I'd, I'd like to take it in a little different direction here. Certainly the technology that uh, Dr. Gazarek talked about in manufacturing technologies and those kind of things that uh, we have to solve in order to go do a Mars mission um, will cause us all to be more competitive, but um, one of the things that I've noticed internally within our industry is that now that we are converging on common goals here, you know, it's amazing how far we've come over the last few years. Now that we're all talking about stepping stones and the kind of missions that we need to do early to get to Mars, and Buzz had some great ideas there about pre-deploying contingency, uh, contingency uh, capabilities and support so that we can actually go do these missions, unlike when Miles mentioned, you know, some of the explorers in the past didn't have that ability. Um, but um, one thing I've noticed in our industry is that because we have this common goal now that while we're still competitive, we are really working closely together. And so it, 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 it creates a different kind of competitiveness. And then if you take that up to a global scale, we're not going to do this mission just in the U.S. alone. This is going to be an international mission. I fully believe that my opinion. Um, and so when you, when you take what we've realized here domestically in, in working together towards a common goal, I really believe that eventually we'll, we'll have a global common goal, and we're starting to see that through, uh, through the ISIG-G and the Global Exploration Roadmap and some of the things that we're, we're mapping out here with uh, national interests bringing their capabilities to the, to the party here on how we get to Mars. And I think that in itself will create a uh, kind of a different competitiveness than, than we traditionally think of. <clears throat> Thank you. And I think we have a question over here. Yeah, hi, I'm Elizabeth Wallace. First, I'd like to acknowledge the person who asked a question right before me. I was an assistant at a presentation he gave at a local STEMS, a STEM at uh, a local school uh, in uh, Tacoma Park, Maryland recently, and it was on Mars. And uh, his room was packed with standing room only. The first uh, class was all 
uh, uh, female students, and I thought, oh, this is a great trend, and the second one was all male, I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but it was, it was a really nice mix of both that were very, very interested, and they stayed the whole time and asked all kinds of questions. So it's about maintaining that kind of inspiration. But the second thing I'd like to say is um, that when we, when we had the Apollo program and, it, and the whole country got excited, as we all know, um, that kind of passion is missing, as we, as we know. Um, but I think we can incentivize by uh, like using, just as the ISS is a, a stepping stone to Mars, I think suborbital space tourism could be a stepping stone to understanding what it likes to, like to be an astronaut and, and have more astronauts in our community that are our neighbors. So at the last Next Gen Suborbital Researchers Conference, I gave a talk called Space Tourism is the New Higher Education. And it was a, um, fun, an idea for fundraising uh, for like an Indiegogo type thing on college campuses so that you can create your own astronaut varsity teams cross-disciplinary and that you vote for and fund the people on your campus to go to space. So that you can tell um, high, uh, middle school students and high school students, go to these universities that have these astronaut varsity programs. And so they can start thinking about what college they want to go to. And then those um, astronauts who come back to campus can help inform the curriculum, can help inform and, and communicate that vision to other people faster because you'll have more people going up. The disincentive right now for suborbital space tourism is the money. So we really need to help them that that should not be the barrier. Um, why not get inspired at 18 when you're in space? Why wait till you're 50 and maybe can afford it? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I don't think that was a question, was it? So, over here. Um, Ken Brandt from the Robinson Planetarium in North Carolina. Very fast, I want you guys to speak to your audience out there on the internet, please, and address this to the kids in the, out there. Why would they invest the time and the energy to do the things it would take to get into a STEM profession? Great That's question. a great question, and I was just thinking about the audience of students and uh, the classrooms that were watching this under the previous question, because I, I do think there are an awful lot of packed classrooms when you talk about this particular topic. Um, you know, there are a bunch of different reasons why somebody would think about the STEM fields as an opportunity. If, if if I'm wearing my hat as a parent for a minute, I'll tell you it's because that's where you'll get a good job and that's where you'll be a great citizen. If I'm wearing my entrepreneur's hat, I'll say that's where you can make a name for yourself nowadays because last time I checked, the best-selling app was just sold for $2 billion. So that might take an afternoon's worth of work somewhere to create that. So that would be wonderful if that was my job. Um, but I would also say, if you're interested in, uh, in where the future is going, that's also where the future is going, in the sense that um, we, we do have a sort of a, an interesting astronaut now. I, I was thinking about the movie Gravity while you were talking and, and the analogy and the, the example that Sandra Bullock has in that movie. But I, I also think that people can see those role models more, more frequently now than they could five or six years ago in terms of seeing the people who are using technology as being ideal. So there are lots of images in our society that can promote that kind of awareness to, to kids. So it's, it's not just about getting a job or doing well. It's also about doing something that's really interesting and fun, which is what most kids are looking for. Great, great answers. Question over yeah. here. Uh, my question had more to do with uh, international uh, competitiveness and our own space industry. Uh, in your opinion, when are we going to reach the point where we're not as heavily reliant on a heritage system for space technology? And when we reach that point, do you think that it will make a huge difference in the rate at which we're advancing in the direction that we take? So uh, I know I'm the moderator, but I'll take a quick, quick stab at that. And, and I really think Bill Gerstemeyer and, and, and Mr. Gazarik actually got that one pretty right this morning, early when they were talking. And the fact is, going to Mars is hard. Going to Mars is very expensive. And so we need to put those dollars where we will get, gain the most out of them as far as new technologies that are really required. So solar electric propulsion is one. Uh, the other piece that came up is going to Mars is very risky. And so 
we have astronauts in orbit today, but they're literally minutes away from the Earth's surface if we need to get them home. Uh, so it takes maybe a little bit longer to jump in their spacecraft and come home, but once they've done a, the deorbit burn, it's, they're only about 60 minutes from the Earth's surface. Uh, building step-wise, you know, going about eight days away, which is an assist lunar orbit, is probably a, a next good step. But realistically, when we're going to Mars, you're months and months away from getting back home if something fails and you don't have a backup and alternative. So understanding those systems is really, really critical. The other one that keeps coming up was basic chemical propulsion. It takes a lot of mass. It takes a lot of that to get us all the way to Mars. And so by looking into areas like solar electric propulsion that, that Julie talked about earlier, I think is an area where we really now can be very, very competitive globally, you know, once we develop that technology. And as it was mentioned, either it's got a lot of applications that are very widespread, more so than just helping us get humans to Mars. Uh, and as a human, you probably don't want the human on that system, at least not for the long journey, because it's kind of slow. But for all the other mass and staging of equipment and orbiters and HABs and landers, uh, it's probably a great technology. And, uh, well, Kent, I would just say, adding to that, it, it's, it's actually enabling for some of the architectures that we're talking about. When you start looking at uh, having the ability to take everything with you that you need, including contingencies, it's really, really hard. The, the mass numbers just don't add up. And so having the ability to pre-deploy things, and, and that's what SEP does for you, even though you have to send it way ahead of time, you can pre-deploy assets and contingency capabilities so that you don't have to necessarily take everything with you. And I think that's, uh, that's really enabling for some of the architectures we're talking about, not to mention the fact that it also opens up commercial opportunities. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, U.S. does have a leadership position in some of these areas, but if you look at an endeavor like Mars, I think the endeavor is so broad that to think that we would lead every part of it would, you know, it's probably not practical. I think we, we would look for those things that are, you know, most aligned with where the U.S. interests are. And, and you know, anybody who's a part of this is going to end up with world leadership in some aspect of it. Uh, do you see us uh, relying on U.S.-made rocket engines rather than Russian rocket engines anytime in the near future? At least for the next two weeks. So, you know, my, my perspective is it really is a global world, right? And so as you look at economics in the most efficient way uh, to get payloads into orbit, uh, obviously in the U.S. we have a combination of, of, of rockets made right here in the U.S. Some of the, the different engines are imported, obviously, and, and I'm sure you're referring to the RD-180 issue with the tensions with Russia. But uh, the flip side of that is, What's going on on the space station right now, where there's cosmonauts and astronauts together, uh, near as I can tell, that's been uh, effectively unaffected. And if anything, it helps stabilize the relationships. Yeah. I mean, if, if there's one thing about the ISS that, that has been a tremendous success, it's our ability to work with international partners. And that has worked out very well. And we need to leverage that going forward. In terms of propulsion, I fully believe that down the road in the future, we'll have a combination of foreign and U.S. provided engines. Thanks. Great, great question. Hi. Uh, Chuck Devine. The only group I'm currently a leader of is Metro Washington Mensa. But a few years back, I was also, uh, as part of the Governor's Workforce Investment Board in Maryland, leading a committee dealing with, among other things, uh, getting people to come into tech fields, particularly in aerospace. Uh, some of the things I heard when I was part of the Governor's Workforce Investment Board, young people, now we're not talking 10 or 12 year olds, we're talking about 19, 20, 22 year olds are now starting to avoid STEM fields for reasons such as very poor work-life balance and very poor management in their fields. Uh, 
and also this is the emancipation person and me coming out. One of the things that's become very popular in at least the high IQ groups is, believe it or not, homeschooling because we don't like things like Common Core and we're getting better results teaching on our own than we are seeing in our schools. Uh, would anyone care to comment on this? Uh, are you doing anything to bring these kinds of problems to the attention of the people currently in the fields? I'll take that one. I, you know, there, there are so many interesting dimensions to this. I think to your point about how at any given time, the, the STEM education is certainly not a monolith in the sense that when, when I read the opinion pages about this issue, there's a constant back and forth over whether we have too many of this type of engineer, not enough of that type of scientist. And that's, I think, healthy of the field because it's not monolithic. We don't need more of all STEM graduates and we don't train them all the same. And I think one of the one of the skill sets that uh, is, is still not really a part of the mix that explains some of the trend you're talking about, because what you do see in some fields is a relatively high amount of turnover or leaving of the field by recent college graduates that thought they were going to do thing X, Y, Z, and then find out that the field is really not that. And one of the ways in which you get at that challenge is making sure those kids, so the kids most commonly that don't stay within the STEM fields either didn't have a person in their family that was involved in that field, they didn't have a mentorship experience while they were along the way, they didn't have an internship. And, and the next best explanation is usually that they didn't have the type of training in teams that is how most companies work. And those are all things that are very hard to, to let, they're, they're almost impossible to legislate, but they're even harder to get at in a policy context because they're all social skills. And those are not things that we can expect, you know, standards or policies to address directly. But I think the way we address them is by, if you really make the STEM subjects a priority and we hold the people who run our schools accountable for it, then we'll figure out how to solve those challenges in the same way that we'll figure out what rocket system will get us to Mars if we decide we're really going to go to Mars. Uh, so, hey, thank you. And by the way, I, you bring up a really good point that this generation is different. So I think all of our companies are trying to understand where they're coming from about the, the work-life balance. Social media, I think, is key. And, and how we work with the generations. And the fact is it's a different, it's a much different world today than it was, you know, when, when Buzz sitting here stepped foot on the moon from a country that had just come out of the depression, a very difficult time that we worked through. And it's, it's different now, so I, I think we should expect different generations. So, but thank you. Last question. Uh, hello, I am a so I'm Liz Leach, I'm a sophomore at James Madison High School. And so I, re I was really enjoying the talk that's happened so far. And, but one of the things you're mentioning is how parents are aware that there are these opportunities in STEM fields, but the students, not necessarily. And certainly I have a bunch of friends who are interested in STEM fields because I'm one of them. I tend to associate with people like that. But I was wondering if there's some takeaways that I could, so I could communicate Get more, generate more interest in people that I might, might not necessarily be friends with who have, are interested in STEM. So what can I tell them that can inspire them to then at least like, put the, have the thought of then pursuing STEM in college or in a summer program? I would say that, um, you, you know, if we're talking about an endeavor like this, going to Mars, you can be a part of something that is unique. You can leave your mark, you know, and I mean, if you, you can go work in a grocery store, you can go do a lot of other things, work in a bank, but if you're a part of the space program, you can be a part of something that changes humanity. You can be a part of something that generates a new product that no one ever dreamed of, you know. I mean, that's the kind of things that are possible you know, working in fields like with space or, or being a part of a mission like this is you know, you can, you can, and, and you have the opportunity to work with a lot of other smart people who are motivated that way. And, I, and I've had the benefit of doing that my whole career, and it is, has been the best experience of my life. One, one thing I, I'd say, and I guess this is kind of a closing comment since our session is coming to an end, but uh, 
I wonder, you know, I'm just guessing that a lot of your colleagues in school are following things like this on social media. And I would say one of the things that would be an interesting challenge is that there are an awful lot of really cool people tweeting about science and technology issues. And if I were, a, if I were somebody um, running one of these companies who saw a really interesting project that a group of students at your high school were doing, I would want to be involved with it in social media. I think that's a good way to get recognition to show your colleagues that somebody actually actually cares about these things. It's also a potentially good way to raise money for your projects in school, and I don't know anybody who doesn't see that as an incentive to be involved in something. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great questions. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, really enjoyed it. We appreciate your attention.